Pastor Ron Becton from the great state of Tennessee, with his hand on the pulse of not only the world but the church, Amen. pastoring a great and progressive church and ready to move our hearts once again into heavenly places. I'm looking forward today to being fed by the Holy Spirit, aren't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Becton, preach to us today. Thank you, Brother Chance, and praise the Lord, everyone. What a privilege to be here in this wonderful because of the times that has blessed us all for so many years. And once again, we are being filled. Amen. It's an honor to be here and stand before you this morning. Honor to be with all the great leaders of the church and elders and uh, all the elders. There's a couple of elders, Brother Elder Mike Williams and Brother Elder Anthony Mangan. As a young man, still in high school, Brother Anthony would let me come around to some of his revivals years ago. Great inspiration. And then when I first started preaching, Brother Mike Williams was a tremendous evangelist. I appreciate my elders, don't you? Amen. God bless them. Yeah. Praise God. I said that in such a way that I don't want you to misunderstand. I do respect these men, and they have been a tremendous inspiration and still are. Praise God. I think that we're all interested in seeing more than we've ever seen. Yes. Not just seeing something again, but seeing more. Amen. I believe we're getting ready to see some more at this conference. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord wants us to see something more. I believe, and that's not taking anything away from what we have received, but I believe there are some things he wants to add to the equation during this meeting. Amen. Amen. And, the, and the burden of my heart this morning for maybe just a narrow band of folks here, young ministers that you would not miss out, that I would not miss out and see what God wants me to see. Mark the 8th chapter and the 22nd verse, if you want to stand as we just read a few verses of Scripture here. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8, verse 22, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that... After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Can we just thank God for his word again? Lord, your word that's so powerful, that has been so real here already. And we thank you for what you're going to do here all through this day and the days ahead. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Lord bless you. You may be seated. I think we would all acknowledge that this is one of the great miracles of the Bible. And just briefly to recount the events leading up to this tremendous miracle. This man didn't really initiate the trip, I don't think, on his own. The scripture says they brought him. They asked the Lord to touch him. He was there. And of course, the Lord touched him. And after the Lord touched him, he asked this question. And I think it is a pivotal point in this miracle. When the Lord asked this blind man if he saw, the blind man, I believe, was under a lot of pressure to say maybe something that really wasn't the truth. Those friends had brought him and evidently they had seen Jesus touch somebody and somebody would be healed at that touch. They were expecting the blind man to say, hey, I see, everything's all right. The blind man knew that. The blind man wanted to be able to say that because he had heard their testimony of what the Lord had done. And I'm sure when he opened his eyes and didn't see like he thought he was going to see, he was just a little bit frustrated. And then he, I'm sure, was wondering what the Lord would say if he didn't say, hey, I thank you for my healing. I thank you for my sight. 
So I think the temptation was there for him to uh, say other than the way it really was. To say, yeah, this is great, and, and maybe even just go on and accept what he had received. So I think one of the key points in this miracle was the ability of this man to be honest about his status. He just simply said, in a few short words, things aren't like I'd like them to be. I see men, I see trees, and I really can't distinguish between the two. And I wish I could do it different. I wish I could say everything's all right, but he didn't. And really, when you look at this miracle, that is the only response this man gave that's recorded. He didn't come with a boldness of faith. He didn't come like blind Bartimaeus and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Friends brought him. They asked the Lord to touch him. And all that we have is just an honest response to that question. Just an honest response. And I think in this meeting, one of the things that will help us receive what God wants us to have is just to be honest. I believe we're feeling that healthy honesty around here. Praise God. Thank God for grade A faith. Thank God for first in the pool faith. Thank God for just say the word, Lord, and it'll be done faith. But God honors other things besides just grade A faith. He honors, I believe in this story, honesty. Just honesty. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. I'm afraid, and I like to feel faith. I like to feel great A faith. I like to pray and know that someone's going to be healed. But I'll go ahead and pray if I don't know that. Amen. Praise God. I like to feel that kind of faith. But I'm afraid sometimes we pressure people into responses that they really aren't comfortable with. Because they are afraid they're going to be sent to the back of the line if they don't say, everything's all right now that you touch me. Amen. What do you mean here? Don't you want your healing? At least you could say you're claiming your healing. And I believe there's time to claim our healing. Don't misunderstand me. He just honestly said, and he didn't have a bad spirit, and he didn't have a bad attitude. He just had bad sight. That's right. Just bad sight. And he just explained it. I, I see men over here, and I see trees, and I can't tell the difference. After that, not after a bold declaration of faith, after that honest response, verse 25 said, he put his hands again upon his eyes, made him look up, and he was restored. I don't think that honesty is the enemy of faith. Praise God. I think we can be honest here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After what? After he just made an honest declaration. I think all through the scripture we see examples of that. Elisha's servant, whom we sometimes criticize, he just saw what was there. Enemy chariots. That's all. Amen. But after that he expressed his doubt. He wasn't disqualified. He wasn't put at the back of the line. The servant prayed for him and his eyes were open. After that honesty, his eyes were open. Simon Peter, fishing, had fished all night, had taken nothing. And the Lord says, now I want you to go back out there. And, and Simon said, ah, we didn't see any last night, and I don't see any tonight. And his aching arms and his doubting heart, still he went ahead. It wasn't perfect faith, but he went ahead. He had enough faith to go ahead. Amen. Hallelujah. Peter in prison, and he's uh, released from that prison. And he goes to the door of the house where they were praying, knocks on the door, and the little servant says, uh, somebody's here. They didn't say, oh, we know who that is. That's Peter. We've been praying. He's out of prison. <laughs> they couldn't. Not, I believe there's times when we can see beforehand, and God gives us faith, and, and it, it might be that uh, they could have visualized him being free, but uh, they didn't visualize him being free when he was in prison. They couldn't visualize him being free when he was out of prison. Right. Amen. 
They were astonished. Amen. But they went ahead and prayed. They went ahead and had faith. It wasn't grade A faith. It wasn't perfect faith. They didn't see it happen before they prayed. No, they didn't, but they went ahead. And just they're honest. They were honest about it all, and God took care of it. Just one other example. Over in uh, Luke, the 24th chapter, those disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're disappointed. They're sad. In verse 21, they say, We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. They, were let, they felt let down. They were disappointed. But the Lord didn't put them at the back of the line. He didn't disqualify them. He heard them out. Scripture says their eyes were holding. They couldn't see. But they're, they're just being honest with how they feel. They couldn't say otherwise. And the Lord listens to them. And then the Lord talks to them. I believe the Lord wants to listen to us this way. Just be honest with the Lord. Hallelujah. And then he's going to talk to us. And then our hearts are going to burn within us. And then our eyes are going to be open. We're going to be able to see. Hallelujah. 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 And then we're going to be able to rise up and go right back to maybe that disappointment and that defeat with victory. Praise God. After that. After that. And I believe the Lord may be looking for that here. Now, I know that for the most part, there's grade A faith here. There's first in the pool faith. There's speak the word only faith. But there may be a narrow band of folks here who don't have that kind of faith. You're not disqualified. <laughs> Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, now you can have grade A faith and be honest. I'm not pitting one against the other. But if all you have is just honesty this morning, that could be all that the Lord wants. I believe he designed it that way for that blind man. He knew what he was doing. He wasn't surprised at the man's response. I believe he was kind of excited that he had the ability to be honest and say, this is the way it is. Hallelujah. Another thing that I think sometimes keeps us from seeing more, and that is when, when we're so full of a lot of good things, it's hard to have any more. And sometimes, in, uh, and it's been said with our revelation with truth, it's hard to realize that we could have any more. And again, thank God for revelation truth and this wonderful apostolic salvation plan, a new birth experience. But I believe there are some things the Lord can still add to us. Peter expressed it on the day of Pentecost, what we believe. But there was still more that he needed. There was still some more revelation. And in Acts the 10th chapter, we have this wonderful account of what took place. And that vision, and then going on to Cornelius' household. And then in, in verse 33, Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive. One translation says, Now I understand. Now I see. It was that he didn't see things before, but he's seen more now. That implies that there was a moment in time when he didn't see that. But now, there is a moment when it starts to come in on him. And that's what I think is going to happen this week. We're going to have some now I understand moments. Praise God. Fresh revelation truth. That doesn't take away anything from what we already know, but it extends us further. He said, now I understand, now I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Amen. And then he ends up by saying, this is the bottom line of my new revelation. He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. I think that's a wonderful addition to uh, salvation truth. When I really know, evidently he didn't understand that, but he said, now I see, now I understand. He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. Oh, that revelation makes a difference. 
Amen. And it, again, it didn't, he didn't minimize what he had learned. It didn't diminish. He didn't reject it. You know, some people, before they can embrace something new, they have to let go of what they've already had. I don't think you have to do that. He didn't do that. You know what his new revelation did? It allowed him to expand the kingdom. It was after he had that now I understand moment that he was able to open up the doors to the Gentiles. I believe we're going to have some now I understand moments this week that's going to help us go back and enlarge the borders of the kingdom. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now I understand. And so if we're honest, and so if we're open, and then if we can recognize just the, the so powerful potential of, of still being here. I'm glad I'm still here. I'm glad I'm here today. Amen. Knowing that I've been, I guess, to every one of these and, and other wonderful meetings, and as has been mentioned, maybe I haven't responded to everything like I should have. But I'm still here. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The potential is still there. Yeah. And uh, this, I read this the other day, and it... Uh, it kind of describes this uh, feeling of excitement that I feel here. You know, Peter wasn't always right. Matter of fact, he hardly ever was right. <clears throat> Someone said he usually got there first and got right later. <clears throat> but he just kept hanging in there. He kept hanging around. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm still hanging around. Opportunity for something here because I'm still here. We're still here. It's not over. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me read this to you if you don't mind. He was there when Jesus said, Follow me. He was no prize, but he was there. He was there at the Sermon on the Mount. He was no humble peacemaker, but he was there. He was there at the feeding of the multitudes. He had little faith, but he was there. He was there at the revelation of the Messiah. He became proud, but he was there. He was there at the transfiguration. He spoke out of turn, but he was there. He was there in the upper room. He would not wash feet, but he was there. He was there in the garden. He went to sleep, but he was there. He was there when they came for Jesus. He used the sword. He shouldn't have, but he was there. He was there at Jesus' trial. He lied and he denied and he cried, but he was there. And he was there at the cross. He followed from afar off, but he was there. He was there when Mary told him of the resurrection. He was surprised, but he was there. He was there at Galilee when Jesus appeared. It hurt to be questioned three times, but he was there. He was there at the ascension and commission. He didn't fully understand, but he was there. He was there at Pentecost. He was drunk with joy and power. Praise God. He was there. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he kept on hanging in there. He kept on showing up. Praise God. Praise God. There's somebody here today in this meeting. You just kept on, you went on and you, you made whatever you had to do to get here. Thank God you're here. Thank God you're still here. Praise God. And we can leave here with some after that experiences. We can leave here with now I understand experiences. Let's all stand together and just clap our hands to the Lord again. Thank God.
I, I'm so happy today to be able to say that Brother Harold Hoffman is a neighbor of mine and still my friend. That's, that's good news this morning. That tells you something about me. I mean him. Praise the Lord. I appreciate Brother Hoffman. He's a man who loves God. Of all the things I could say today, he's a Christian. And he loves the gospel. Let's receive the word of the Lord through our minister, Brother Hoffman, this morning. Let's clap under the Lord together. And as you clap, let's shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Why don't you turn around and shake somebody's hand and tell them, even though I have to sit beside of you today, I'm going to get something good from God. I uh, must confess to you that... Uh, this meeting hasn't been as fun for me as all of the others have. Um, I've always come to this meeting to kind of take a bath. Uh, it always has cleansed me and purified me, and the prospect of speaking to you hasn't been necessarily one that I've delighted in. But uh, I, I am grateful for what this meeting has consistently meant to me through the years as a young man. And uh, there's a scripture in Psalms, uh, I believe from 120 to 135, it, there's a little notation between Psalms and, and when the Psalm begins. It just says a Psalm of degree. And uh, it appears that when they went to Jerusalem, those 15 Psalms between 120 and 135, depending on where they were in relationship to the city, they would... They would quote and they would rehearse these psalms and as they went up or ascended, it is apparent and very wonderful to realize that one of the last things that was quoted there before you ever got to the city was it said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And this is why it says it's like that precious ointment that ran down the head and the beard, and then it qualifies the beard. It said even Aaron's beard, and down his garments and down to his feet. And it says just as sure as you could depend on dew every morning being on Hermon's Mount and Zion's Peak, you could be just as sure that God would anoint the priest and command life evermore if people would just get together. Unity is such a wonderful thing because the priest always gets anointed when people come together. And uh, this meeting is a wonderful example of that. I'm going to read to you from the book of Timothy. And uh, this is a, I, I don't, it's evolved into much more than that, but I've been told that in its genesis was intended to be a meeting to young ministers. And... Uh, I trust we're all childlike, <clears throat> not childish. And uh, um, First Timothy chapter two, verse five. There is one mediator, or one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse number eight. I will therefore <clears throat> that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Notice 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly ray, but which becometh women professing godliness 
with good works. Praise God. Now turn around and uh, say, uh, I know I'll get something good from God because I'm sitting beside of you today. And let's heal the rift. And you may be seated. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11 is divided into two broad, very holy subjects. Those subjects are authority and the body. They are not hair and communion. Hair is not holy, but it is rather a symbol of something that is very holy, and that is authority. Communion is not holy, but rather is a symbol of something that is very holy, and that is the ability to recognize what the body is. Wilded, weak, spiritual myopics that seemingly always test positive for what I guess you could call Pentecostal pygmyism are the people that always have a rough time finding the body. Don't have any concept of what my brother and my sister really is. Communion is not just intent on reminding us about the man on the middle cross. Communion is every time you do it, remember the body. Remember the body. This gives us a little insight into 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 46 where it says, How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So there is an order here. If you have natural communion, it sets the stage for spiritual communion. Hair, which is um, a natural thing, is a symbol of a great spiritual truth. And that is that God has order in the earth. God needed a liaison between heaven and earth. He had a real problem. And uh, that is simply that man could never become God. It's always been very uh, important to me that in Genesis it said, man was made in God's image. And um, it's very obvious from the Bible what God's image is. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 said, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Colossians 1 and 15 said that we have been translated into the kingdom of the Son, and the Son was the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 and 3 said that the Son was the express image. We're not talking trains here. Express means so unique, one of a kind, will never be another, can't be reproduced. If I put 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, Colossians 1 and 15, Hebrews 1 and 3, and marinate them together, I can scripturally say that Jesus Christ was the only image that God ever had. But man was made in God's image, and God didn't even have an image back then. But that presents no problem to him because he just am. Just in the same way that Revelation says there was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world and you'll never find Calvary in the 50th of Genesis. You must go much further down the line. It seems that from the beginning, God planned that one day He would take an earthly set of duds out of layaway. And according to Romans, the first man, Adam, was the similitude of Him that was to come. And so He simply used the body that He would one day have as the precursor and the blueprint to build the first man Adam God put a link between God and men therefore when we get to Corinthians 11 and 3 the thing becomes very obvious God has got order there is a woman and then there is a man and linking man and God is the man Christ Jesus the mystery of iniquity is when men try to become God. The mystery of godness is when God succeeds in becoming man. He fashioned a body. He did something there at Bethlehem that had never been done before. I am here to tell you very simply in Corinthians 11 and also in Because of the Times, there is still order in the earth. There is still order in God's world. 
There is great confusion in our world today. Who could have ever told us that 33 wars would exist and 24 of them, it's been said, are religiously motivated. The Sikh is against the Hindu. The Protestant fights the Catholic in Londonderry and Belfast. You will find even recently the Muslim from Iran called the Muslim from Iraq, an infidel. And both of them said, Allah told me to do this to you. There is great confusion and that same confusion exists in the evangelical ranks as well because there is a question in so many people's mind who hears from God anyway who would have ever guessed just several years ago the three of the four most high profile televangelists would fall in just a matter of months who would have ever, ever dreamed that we would learn about air-conditioned dog boxes and mercenary prophets with their gold fixtures? Who of us would have ever, ever dreamed that the tinkler who apparently tickled more than ivories would trade the world's oldest profession for the old-time religion and his golden gospel piano? Who would have ever dared imagine that this character would become a quasi-Pentecostal and the man from Tulsa would don a, a used car salesman smile and all of a sudden he'd begin by preaching faith and end up building hospitals that he no longer can afford the light bill on so it requires you to turn God into a hit man and then this, is it any question or is it any surprise to you and to I that the man is appropriately named Oral which just where I come from means a lot of talk. There is great confusion today, but I promise you that God has a chain of command that when implemented, it creates a link between heaven and earth. Jacob saw angels ascending and descending. There is supposed to be traffic. It is not monologue. It is dialogue. There is supposed to be discourse between our world and his. Angels aren't supposed just to carry my petition up. They are likewise mandated to bring my answers down. And I want you to understand that this is accomplished when submission is practiced. And when submission and authority and God's command is practiced, the latter is minus no rung and angels traffic without tripping. I will be very honest to you that as a young man, I was impacted by the ministry of a gifted few that were supernaturally and uncommonly anointed. It was heady stuff to me as a young teenage kid to get to preach in the pulpit of one of those men that I idolized so very much. But 15 years later, last summer, I was on a vacation with my family. I decided to take an afternoon and drive to find that touted sanctuary that I had heard so much about that was about to be built in that city. And when I finally found the juncture of those two major roads in that community, and I walked into that pagoda-style sanctuary, they were tearing up all of the platform and in installing a, a, a wooden floor. There was a large ball, a disco ball that was hanging from the ceiling and the man that was there, all he could talk about to me was, I don't know what they used to do in this building, but he said that platform was built to hold an entire circus of elephants. I don't know and I just sat there and I cried and I, I knew what used to go on inside of that sanctuary and I had to admit all over again that Clayton Moore would never be relevant again. Uh, some of you don't know who Clayton Moore is. He, uh, you're a much poorer young preacher if you don't. Because when I was a kid, Clayton Moore was the epitome of holiness. You see, he had a white hat. He would don white duds. He uh, would very, very arrogantly and proudly straddle white stallion. He uh, was ribbed and ringed with silver bullets. <laughs> he would always peek with mysterious steel blue eyes from beneath the black mask, ride away into the sunset with a hearty high ho silver. Man, I used to love that guy. Die, but I am here to tell you from the bottom of my heart I have never been convinced more than now that the day of the Lone Ranger is over. Yeah. I am convinced that there is a great key to being under authority. 
I have learned that you will never have authority unless you are willing to voluntarily subject yourself to authority. Don't expect to have obedient children if you're a rogue daddy. Don't expect to have obedient saints if you're a loose cannon pastor. Because it seems that pity is the highest of human emotions, but self-pity is the lowest of human emotions. Never doubt, my dear brother, that there is a great key given to us, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy. David made a distinction in, he, in Psalms 51 between gladness and joy. Gladness is a smile, how much gum you can show above your denture. But joy is a spiritual fruit that gives strength. It is therefore something very apparent in Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It is apparent that my Lord hung on the cross. He did not grin. He was not glad, but he manifested the strength-giving fruit of joy because joy is not a grin. Joy is not this syrupy sentimentality that is promoted among all of us as what we apostolic Christianity is I want you to understand the link to joy is 15 of Luke that that man left the 99 white envelopes that safely ended up on Monday morning's desk and looked for the one that was lost and when he came back with that one on his shoulder he didn't come back glad he came back strong because he came back rejoicing The weakest creatures in the world are burdenless preachers because they do not understand the secret to strength is joy and the secret to joy is burden. Isn't it amazing that Ivan Boski steals 600 million, gets 18 months in prison, serves six and gets out. Jim Baker steals six million, gets 45 years of striped sunshine. I saw a picture of Jim Baker in shackles. I didn't even see shackles on Jeffrey Dahmer. Why? Because the world will tolerate a lying broker much quickly than it will ever tolerate a scheming, hypocritical preacher. They're sick of it. They're nauseous with it. Something must happen to us. This is a confusing age. Last Easter, I had a man, and I, I'm sure I'm no different than you. I just really don't know how to handle this. I, uh, we, we, we won a man to God, and, and he brought his, his, his second wife to church, and she prayed through. And then he brought his ex-wife to church, and she prayed through. And then we baptized his boy that was of course the son of his first marriage and on Easter morning we've got him there and his second wife and his first wife and their boy and behind them we had a, 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 a man that fell in the ministry and he was there with his second wife and her children and behind them was his first wife and all of her kids and all of his grandkids and I wonder what in the name of God guess who in the rapture whose wife is she going to be anyway I didn't know what in the world to preach uh, it's just it's just con confusing and 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 and, and it, it's not original with me but but they talk about something that will will come to us and we see the the the, the beginnings of of what's known as syncretism of, of people that are going to turn churches and finding a church into a spiritual smorgasbord. Uh, I like the little that anointing and I want you to make sure preacher that you maintain my goosebump machine but but I want you to know right now I have a real major problem with that commitment stuff. It is very 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 hard to assimilate people into the body and teach them submission if there is not submission that is exemplified before them in the pulpit. We had a folks 
one of these poor Pentecostal tumbleweeds came to us. Nobody wanted much to do with us when we were in the old school building. But now that there's a beautiful building going up, it's kind of cute to see these characters that kind of roll in with no roots. And if, I'd just be very honest with you. I look at them and say, you don't need to join our church. You need to join AAA. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. To understand. You want to talk to me about numbers? Numbers don't impress me anymore. The real dictate of our church is how many people will we use? And show me your financial records. Money is very indicative of a man's posture with God. I learned only too well. This is the fourth year of a building program. Money's always the last thing I get and the first thing I lose. Hallelujah. Authority is the issue that is addressed in Corinthians 11, not women's hair. I, I, I'll be very frank with you. I, I, I recognize I am in a, in a pulpit, not my own, but I will feel very free to address this issue here today. Uh, I, I don't travel nearly as much as I do, but I do see some things that greatly, greatly concern me. And uh, I, I, I ask God... I. I I'll be honest with you, I, I became very frustrated with these 16-year-old girls that get pregnant in our youth groups. And I, 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 all of this, and I, I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to put a band-aid on this, and I'm, I'm not a quick-fix man, but I, I, I asked the Lord to help me, and for what it's worth, this is what God gave to me. I, I searched through Corinthians 11 and found three key words chair or angels and covering and glory and tried to find where in the world was it that those three things were first mentioned in the Bible and in sifting back through the Old Testament it became apparent that those three words were first mentioned in conjunction with the ark the ark was a gold box that contained for, for sake of time simply the law of God on top of that gold box was a gold lid called the mercy seat it was covered by cherubs that were literally welded at the base of that mercy seat and they uniquely always bowed and looked at the mercy and never one another. And it seems that I have a story to go along with this in Samuel when the ark finally went back to Joseph and the Beshemites. Someone took the box. Someone took the lid. Someone took the covering off of the box. It was a unique thing because that box held these holy justice, these judgment things of God. And it was covered by this gold lid. And these angels were here. And the Shekinah literally dwelt the visible manifestation of God's glory literally dwelt like between probes and posts and circuits between those cherubs it is amazing to me that a God that spent thousands of years flanked by angels would end up on earth flanked by thieves and yet you've got something here in this ark it seems that as long as you kept the lid on the box the angels were welded into the lid and there was glory that always rested between there but when you took the covering off you forfeited the angels as well and the glory had no place to perch I am not preaching long hair or short hair I would just simply preach uncut hair I want you to understand that I am convinced that the secret to Corinthians 11 is to go back to the ark and if we will keep the covering on the box everything beneath the cherubs will be our ally and not our opponent But if you take the covering off yeah. and you literally expose yourself to naked law, yeah. hallelujah. It is amazing to me that women, I believe in modesty, that modesty is quiet strength. I, uh, I may be very wrong about this, but I really don't find much mention in the scripture to modest men. I find modesty used in reference to women again and again and again. It's amazing to me that women will allow these characters to dictate to them what beauty really is, and it's been my experience that most of these characters don't even like girls. With the exception of Australia, I've been in every major airport in the world. 
And I want you to know, ladies, you don't have to speak Arabian, you don't have to speak Japanese. If you want to find the ladies' room, there is an international symbol that dictates to everybody what a lady is. If it is not for sale, don't put it in the window. My dear sister, will you come here? Please, would you come? I, I, I'm not going to be rude. Please. I want you to know that underneath, come up here just a minute. Underneath these coats are dresses. They're just cold. Please. Please come. Now you tell me. Now uh, it probably wouldn't work in Alexandria because this city is... Uh, seen much of this, but if you go with me to Detroit, I could take these ladies with me to some places. You tell me who's going to get the longest glance. Me with my suit and my nice hairdo, or these ladies with their dresses and their beautiful hair and their powderless pores. You tell me. Have you been called a legalist lately? I have. But I will tell you this, for every scripture the Bible uses to condemn legalism, and you better believe it condemns legalism, there is every other offsetting scripture that demands obedience. demands obedience. I'll, be, I'll tell you my problem. In my attempt to be fair and equitable and create parity, whenever I would teach on these things, I would always, one for the ladies, one for the men. You know? <clears throat> talk about ladies' hair. And then you've got to talk about men's hair. Only problem is I don't talk all that about men's hair. But I would, because I've got to be fair. And we talk about ladies' dress, and then I talk about men's dress. But I really didn't have a whole lot of scripture for men's dress. But I had to be fair. <laughs> Listen, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Without wrath and doubting, in like manner also. That means um, just as difficult and is just as much emphasis as you have placed on the men, place it on the women. And then he goes into addressing modest women. He doesn't address modest men. You know why? We've got enough of them. We do not need modest women and modest men. We need modest women and praying, worshiping men. I will be the first to admit, ladies, you've got it much more difficult than I do in regards to appearance. It requires no discipline on my part, no boldness, no courage to dress as I do. Nobody is arrested by my appearance. But if I take my wife and my girls anywhere in public, it always says the same thing. They never notice the handsome, aggressive, yuppie, intelligent, incredibly preaching machine that I am. They just always say, look at all that hair. My daughter, 
is the only girl that wears a dress in her first grade class. She stands out. She is willing to absorb the sarcastic jeer. She is willing to be touted. She is willing to just let all of that fling around her. Ladies, I will be very honest with you. I want men to be just as willing to endure sarcasm about our worship and about our prayer as the way you've been willing to absorb the criticism of your generation in regards to your uncut locks and your long dress. If you're going to scream about hair, if you're going to scream about dresses, if you're going to scream about the lack of paint, we must demand that men be just, just, just as adamant about their prayer and their worship. Isn't it amazing that Eve ate the fruit? And yet in Romans 5 it says, For by one man sin entered into the world. Because when a man was always there in conjunction with his wife, it was the man that always caught the heat. Say what you want, but Jesus said, I got my flesh from my mother, but I got my power from my dad. I am not relegating women to nurseries alone, but I am here to say we must no longer refuse to understand how important it is for men to be men of prayer and to lead in worship. This meeting is saying something very loud and clear to us. I will no longer be just enough to look good. It will no longer be enough, sir, preacher, young evangelist, just to wear your Hugo boss suit, your Gucci everything. I must understand, dear Jesus, it is not enough for me to just walk into a church and to plop myself down beside of a lady who has allowed people to thring and flow things at her for years. I think just because I look as good as her, I've done as much as she has done. No, she did her part by being modestly attired. She said something to the world with her hair. God's way is the best way. But oh God, give us men who in like manner also will be willing to pray. Ladies, you have done your part. I do not claim to understand it, but I will be so bold as to say, I genuinely leave because of your uncut hair. We have angels with us. I believe you bring them with you. Ministering spirits come with that lady. But you can't let that get loose in your church because you see, if you start whacking off that hair, what happens here is there's a chain reaction. There's an attitude that comes with a situation that goes out from under authority. And what happens first is the wife tells her husband what she will no longer do. And then that gets into the church because he said, I speak a great mystery. I'm not talking about men and women. I'm talking about Christ and his bride. And if that thing gets loose in you, then after a while, the bride will tell the groom what they will and will not do. Hallelujah.
a scepter shall not depart from Judah. Judah is praise. But in Esther 5, she put on Shalel number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Stood up wind of the king with no formal petition before him. And as he does his daily doings, he gets a whiff of that and looks up to see her. But he doesn't just say, come here, he says. The scepter was the welcome of the king. Never doubt, gentlemen, that you will never live long enough to separate the king's welcome from your worship. And I'll just be very honest with you. Thank you, ladies, for being true through the years. Thank you. And what do you say today, gentlemen? Why don't we lead this conference today in worship and prayer? God bless you.